well, it's, <coughs> it's a great honor to um, be chairing the final session of this amazing meeting. Um, I first met Joe approximately 57 years ago, 1960-ish, when we were first year mathematics students in Cambridge. And um, it's been a great pleasure to see Joe's enormous impact on cosmology over the years, starting with his 1968 paper on the silk, the silk uh, damping. Um, Joe has Joe is, uh, set a great example to us as well by completely denying the existence of retirement. <laughs> and um, I note that in the past five years, that's between age 70 and 75, he's been an author on 115 refereed papers. <laughs> So, Joe, congratulations on your extraordinary career. Over to you. you. Okay. So, thanks so much to all of you for this uh, wonderful party. Um, and um, I thought what I would do is just um, talk a bit about the past, a bit about the present, a bit about the future. Um, so... Um, uh, let's think about the past. Now, I'm addressing this to the younger people also, in part, um, because I think when you go into, um, into research, especially in astrophysics, it's great to have intuition, um, but you also need data, and it's a delicate combination of the two. And so I want to tell you about my sort of experience. Um, so I was a graduate student at, um, uh, at Harvard, um, just at a very good time, actually, just after the discovery of, of the CMB. My, um, but at that time, there were pundits, Zeldovich in particular, who for very good reasons, um, he didn't know about the CMB at that time, actually, but he was very a strong proponent of a cold universe, initially cold, for the simple reason that um, if it's cold and dense, it's unstable, and he could solve the galaxy formation problem beautifully, so they get structure, uh, as opposed to having to put initial collisions in by hand. And so my advisor uh, at Harvard, who did uh, know about the CMB, CMB, but as Jim will remember, was somewhat allergic to the Princeton community, David Laser, he was a very strong proponent of the Cold Big Bang. And so there I was, beginning my PhD, w w working for David, and being urged to um, explore things like pycnonuclear reactions in the Big Bang, which would then give you lots of iron, etc. Wonderful theory, actually. It gives you too much iron, in fact. But, but it could make the dust grains that re-thermalize the photons, the CMB, things like this. So it was an interesting approach. However, I did manage to um, uh, develop a different, uh, more or less by accident, a, a different approach. And it was a question, again, of being at the right time, at the right place, at, uh, at that time, just after the discovery of the CMB. And where, where it began for me was this. Um, there was a, um, uh, a biannual um, conference at Woods Hole, a, a summer school, actually, on astrophysical simulation, high dynamical simulations. And every now and then, they'd do one astrophysics. And so you can probably recognize some of the people in this picture from 1966 when I was a second year graduate student looking for a thesis, not having one apart from the cold universe. And um, so I'm, I'm here. And at the back, you see, well, that's uh, Alar Toomery. Um, and there's Peter Goldreich. And uh, let's see, there's George Field, among others. And uh, Bill Saslaw and, and so on. OK. So, um, and that's where basically I did my summer project on um, photon diffusion in you know, this coupled problem of um, hydrodynamics, basically, in the context of the, of the expanding universe, in the, with, you know, as the backdrop, the new discovered radiation field. And the obvious thing then was to think about the fluctuations, etc. And so, so it went. Okay. Um, and then, um, then I went on to think a lot about galaxy formation. Um, and, um, and again, my approach was always, you know, trying to back up the envelope calculations and um, thinking about the analytic approach. But I think it's always important to remember, very true nowadays, that you need simulations with beautiful colors to, to, to make some impression. And so I, I didn't do simulations, but I managed to get the colors right. So this is one of my old transparencies. And so um, 
from a long time ago, but it does, it's interesting, it does have some interesting elements. So this is, this is a cooling curve of um, uh, hydrogen helium plasma. Um, for, okay, and so one applies this now to some uh, galactic gas clouds or enormous cloud, doesn't really matter. And, and you basically um, set the cooling time equal to the free fall time, the dynamical time, and argue star formation should be efficient if you can cool efficiently and less efficient if you can't within that time scale. And, and so you get a plot of density versus temperature that way. And so here it is, the, the density of my mean density of integrating medium and temperature, with think of virial temperature. And then as the universe, the fluctuations develop by the usual gravitational stability theory, the, the fluctuations um, uh, get large, eventually collapse. And so this is, a, this is the cosmological prediction um, for RMS fluctuations from redshift 10 working your way down to redshift zero uh, with the mean density, you know, the usual simple um, over density from spherical collapse of factor 200. And, um, and so within the bounds of this red region, which is the inverse of the cooling curve, of course, you can predict where clouds dissipate efficiently and should therefore make galaxies. And remarkably, when you put on one's estimates of all the different Hubble types, um, you get, you know, ellipticals, S zeros, all you know, and Lyman alpha clouds are just below the line because they have not collapsed significantly, most likely, and the galaxy clusters and groups are, are, are um, below the black line, are out beyond the red line because they do not dissipate on that average density, so distinct galaxies there. So that was, you know, that was where, how I like to interpret data and, and apply intuition to data, and, that, and, and this is more or less what lies behind the, all the various scaling laws that we have today. Okay. Then... Um, I was looking for something else to do, and, and this was really another um, example of chance being in the right place at the right time. So we spent, I spent a summer in, um, more than a summer, a few months in Santa Barbara, where there was, um, in the fairly recent Institute for um, Theoretical Physics, there was um, a summer school on dark matter, and that is where cold dark matter essentially emerged as a paradigm. And, um, um, that was where BBKS, Alex and Nick are here. That's where they developed their paper. And at the time, you know, both Alex and Dick had, and Nick had been my postdocs, etc. So we were all working very closely. And I decided to go in a slightly different direction and began talking to um, particle physicists like uh, Mark Srednicki in particular, and then Keith, Keith Olive. And we thought, well, you know, there must be, you know, if we believe in cold dark matter and it's then it was popular to have this supersymmetric relic particle, the neutralino, photino, had different names in those days, stable. It would be a Majorana particle, not with itself. Maybe you get gamma rays and all that story. So you heard a bit about that from Marco. So that was very nice, and that was a question. And it's not just thinking of ideas like this, but you had to choose a field where there were no experiments yet, and there was no theory. So this, this basically, you know, makes it much easier to, to write papers. And again, in those days, it... <laughs> didn't take very long to write those early papers, so there was nothing to compare them with. Actually, it's not quite true. Uh, when we wrote that first paper, there was one antiproton, one possible antiproton discovered by Louis Alvarez and his group. And, and it, in fact, some, someone reinterpreted it as the first magnetic monopole. That idea went away, but it, I believe it survived as a possible antiproton. But with one particle, you can't do much. So it, it, there was no theoretical constraints. Okay, so... Um, let me now address the question of what sh should we be doing in, um, in next in cosmology. I think you've had a lot, a lot on the dark matter issue. I mean, it's very frustrating now because we've been developing bigger and bigger experiments in dark matter um, with, with um, both for direct detection, indirect detection, um, accelerator experiments, and so far uh, we've found no um, convincing hints. We've had. Um, you know, occasional ex moments of excitement. We thought we discovered a gamma ray line or, or a positron signal or something. All these have basically um, more or less vanished. Um, and we're running into, in a few probably a billion dollars or two time, in, or euros time in terms of expensive experiment, we're going to run into the, the neutrino, the neutrino scattering barrier from through the sun. That's, so in direct detections, we're going to run into a similar financial barrier if we want to go to a more energetic uh, a proton collider. You know, already having spent eight billion on the LHC, it's not clear if you find nothing, you can go on further. Um, and when we look hard at the dwarf galaxies, again, we're still seeing no indications, even though the dark, dom dark matter dominated the dark matter type signal. So um, maybe if you know, giving young people my advice, maybe dark matter is not the right 
place, the most exciting place to be at the moment, unless you have some brilliant new idea. It's hard to find, you know, we're running out of experimental options. We will be eventually. So um, what about dark energy then? Well, here we're in a booming area. We all have all these wonderful experiments um, uh, underway. Um, uh, the trouble is that, um, as you've heard, w everything today um, is focusing on lambda being a constant and p equals minus rho. Now, I don't know how widely known this is, but the first paper explaining p equals minus rho was written in 1933 by Georges Lemaitre. I forgot to bring a copy to put it on my slide. So the idea of vacuum fluctuations has been on for a very long time. Um, and it, of course, has been revived now with the, recent ex with the recent emphasis on understanding better this, this mysterious, very, very small number that we have to live with, um, which we're measuring in the recent universe as, as acceleration. Um, so I, I wonder, really, um, if experiment is, again, it's, one has to do the experiments, but again, advising people on where to go, maybe one should think perhaps of explaining this with theory. And again, the problem with the theory, alternative theory, is to giving us some, some hint of how to understand lambda better, is that um, we clearly need something new, and here are the only two reasons my ideas I've come across. W one is that it might be some sort of quintessence, that, that is, you know, to connect the early universe, the present universe having a very high value, early or low one today. Again, none of the theories out there have, seem to be at all convincing. They're just phenomenological at best. Um, or we can go for this more uh, exotic um, idea of a multiverse, anthropically based, and I, I do not have a high opinion of that because um, while um, you might say that it's, um, it's credible, I think, Martin Rees made, 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 that, made, made that case, um, um, it's explanatory in the sense there are many um, things that can be explained, but it's got no predictions and it cannot be falsified. So it's not a very satisfactory area for me to, to, to think about as... Uh, to, to work in as even being, I would say, physics, let alone a, a project future research. Okay, so what then? Um, the microwave background. So again, this has been um, amazingly productive, and we have a clear, um, uh, maybe two clear ways ahead, okay? So one I will summarize as to be or not to be. So... This is looking for the polarized movement. So the problem here is that we have no robust prediction. I and mean, who knows what re the reheating temperature was? Uh, and the B mode depends critically on that reheating temperature to some significant power even. So, you know, we have to do this. We have to search. We have to get better limits. Go to R of 0.01. That may be our final limit. But um, uh, there's no prediction, robust prediction. So one is going to, one will find this maybe a little bit hard to sell. Um, to the various competing projects, um, but it's very important fundamental physics, of course. So another way you might go is spectral distortions. Well, the beauty of this is that since FireAS, there's a huge amount of parameter space that we can explore because we can improve the FireAS bound on deviations from black body of the cosmic background radiation by you know, three or four orders of magnitude. And I think one of the major hopes would be to look for the dissipation signal of galaxies and the beauty of this signal is that while we've measured lots of galaxies, you know, in this range over here, which are the standard galaxies and clusters, you can work your way down to the dwarfs, okay, because they, those structures dissipate too. And in principle, all that will give you a spectral distortion. All of this happens indeed in the, um, you know, in the after black body thermalization, uh, after the first few months, there's a period then where you can actually trap a signal. The problem with this, I think it's a great thing to do, it, maybe it should be the prime motivation, Pixie could not get that sensitive, maybe the new experiments will, being discussed, but the problem is you, all you get at the end of the day is one number, okay, the mu distortion, and that means it's going to be hard to interpret, but still, it's, it's a target. Okay, so I think there is one way to go, and this is now I want to discuss the future, and um, I think the region that's most poorly explored, we haven't even mentioned this really in the past th three days, is the Dark Ages. Okay, and let me try to explain why I think that um, it's the time to really push hard on the Dark Ages. So, um, so here in this um, schematic, you can see the temperature of gas compared to the CMB temperature. And um, in, in recent times, you've got lots of... Um, 
nonlinearity, galaxies forming, black holes, in the X-rays, and so the IGM heats up. But there was a while early on when the CMB temperature cooled down at 3 Kelvin uh, where the matter cooled even more. So in principle, at that epoch, there should be hydrogen clouds, the ones that made today's galaxies, and you can map them in principle in absorption against the CMB. And, um, so, and this is a totally unexplored area. People are now focusing a lot on reionization of the universe, very important, but to go back even further would be really, you know, understanding cosmology, I think, even better, okay? So, um, and this is the reason why you want to do this, okay? So here is the CMB, okay? This is the power spectrum of the CMB. This is the predicted power spectrum for the first clouds in the universe, which I've cut off at the mass which is too small for gas to, to cool and condense. So there's a huge parameter range. Remember, we're talking about, you know, these are wave numbers, these are million solar mass inverse megaparsecs, so this corresponds to, to, to galaxies uh, over here somewhere, clusters basically over here. This is the, the, the first peak, 100 odd, 100 odd megaparsecs. And so, you know, the, the CMB runs out of power, right? So we, but if we can explore this region, we suddenly get the possibility of having enormously more information on structure formation. That's the only, if we can, if we can tap this. And so the trouble is, you want to go to, um, to get the building blocks, the million solar mass clouds, you've got to go to, to Ks of 10 to 100. Um, that means going from 21 centimeters now to redshift 50, which means going down to 30 megahertz. And that is very, very challenging. Okay. Um, but there is a prediction, okay? So if you could ever do this, there's an amazing prediction, okay? If you can get all this information out of the sky. The prediction is that all inflation models robustly predict something, and that is primordial non gaussian energy. And there's a simple expression for it. And people debate about whether this is accurate to a factor of a few, but let me just show you the expression. It's the scalar index, 0.96, measured by Planck, minus 1. Okay, modulus of that. That's about 0.03. And what you're measuring is this parameter. It's the quadratic correction, um, the first indications of non gaussianity FNL, to the temperature fluctuations. Okay, so that, that should be the target, 0.01, let's say. However, it's really, really difficult because Planck limits, and in general, all CMB limits ever, I will argue, are stuck at about 10. You can never do better for this than 10. Um, and um, the reason is you just count the number of modes on the sky. So in the CMB, we work to L of about 1,000, and you have about a million modes, as you heard in, in um, Francois' talk earlier. A million modes, and one over root a million is 0.1%. You can never do better than 0.1% cosmology with a CMB. You're not, and so you're going to be stuck at FNL of order 10. Let's suppose we take the next step, which is galaxy surveys, and the biggest one of all is LSST, which is promising us 20 billion redshifts, photometric redshifts, okay? That's enormous. You'll think that will give you a huge increase in the number of modes. The trouble is that a galaxy is a very dirty um, independent probe. And so if you're optimistic, you might increase the number of modes by a factor of 100. Now, no one has really done this calculation kind of in detail, but this is just a guess, okay? Which means you can win a factor of 10 on the CMB when I take the square root of that. So, okay, that's great. I can now get down to um, FNLs of order 1, which is more or less what they forecast in the new generation Euclid, etc., of large-scale galaxy surveys. So that's out there. You can see that for yourself. To do really better, there is only one way to go. You've got to increase the number of modes enormously, and that is the dark ages. And by suddenly opening yourself up to all these million solar mass clouds, you can increase the number of modes. And not only, not only that, it's even better, because now you can slice the universe up, because you know 21 centimeter frequency so well, into you know, maybe 100 slices along line of sight. And by tomography, you win another factor of, of 100. So I think you can, in principle, get up to numbers that would improve on large-scale structure by number of modes by 10,000, accuracy by 100. So suddenly you're down from the of order 10 to of order 0.01. So in principle, you can do that. Okay. But the problem is um, if you go to the dark ages. But there is a slight problem. You can't do it from the Earth. It's impossible because the SKA will indeed go to 30 megahertz. That's, that's in their vision. But we've got the Earth's ionosphere. It's going to be really noisy. And um, we've got, you know, cell phones and, you know, all the usual things, even in Western Australia. And so 
there's no way they can get the needed sensitivity. So the best place to go is the most radio quiet site in the inner solar system, which is the far side of the moon. Okay, so that's where we have to go. And so the scheme is that we will eventually, I'll show, I'll give you more details in a second, um, send out lunar rovers and they will be carrying large rolls of mylar and on the mylar we'll 3D print dipoles. We need dipoles, we're talking about 10 meter type, your TV antenna type, type wavelength. So, and we roll these dipoles over the back side of the moon, over a, a large area, and um, that'll be the basic um, lunar radio interferometer. And um, here are some, some numbers. Um, you basically um, can estimate what sort of diameter you might need, um, and that's of order 100 kilometers to work at a wave of 10 meters. You need millions of dipoles to get this weak signal. SKA will have half a million dipoles. SK, I mean, the number is not crazy to have millions of dipoles or 10 million dipoles. Um, but, you, but you're looking, here's the real problem. You're looking for a 10 millik signal against galactic foregrounds of thousands of Kelvin. So that's the real problem. But the signal you're looking for is lines. It, you know, it's different in frequency from the more continuous galactic fore, foregrounds. And, and I, I, perhaps if you're very clever, you'll think of ways to, to beat the noise down. Okay, so that's the story for radio astronomy. Now, if we do this, there's a bonus, okay, because you can also do amazing infrared astronomy on the moon. So let me tell you that story um, briefly. And this, again, is a vision for the future. If you're an infrared astronomer, you really should be thinking about this. So on the moon near the South Pole, there are uh, a lot of large craters. And being near the South Pole, being North Pole means you're in so, sort of more or less perpetual twilight. It never gets too hot or too cold as it does on the equator. And some of these craters, and I'll show you a close-up of the Shackleton Crater, which is uh, one of these, or this one, um, 20 kilometers across, okay, four kilometer high rims, um, uh, covered with ice most likely, as mapped by um, an Indian satellite, we're not quite sure of that, and very cold. It's been mapped with the NASA Diviner spacecraft, 30 Kelvin, 30 Kelvin all the time, okay? It's in permanent shadow. So a great place, and what Camille Flammarion noticed a long time ago was that the rims of the crater are in perpetual sunlight being near the pole. He called that la lumière perpetuelle. Right? So you can imagine solar power and your telescopes, and in fact, the prospects to explore the moon will almost certainly use the proximity of craters like this because that's where you'll be able to get permanent power, which you need. You don't want to have a two-week gap in your power if you're building things on the moon, etc. cetera. Um, so that would be the idea. Now, how realistic is any of this? Are we ever going to go to the moon? Well, the answer is we're already there. Um, so first, the Chinese are there. So this is a Chinese telescope, the only telescope on the moon. Um, the company that built this is has a big you know, advertising slogan on it. But, so they're, they're, that's the Chinese rover, and they're planning more, more like this. Um, but, um, but, you know, we're not content to let the Chinese lead the way, so now there is um, a European effort. So there's a new Director General of ESA who's been giving speeches about going to the moon to build a moon village. And so this is a, an artist schematic of, um, of life on the moon in the moon village. The idea is to use local materials plus water to, um, you know, to build all your construction there, and he talks about business and tourism on the moon. Those are the two of the goals. And, of, and the idea is to get a lot of commercial support behind this. And the business might include mining or whatever, the tourism, whatever. Um, and, and, you know, it, the time is ripe now to try to convince um, our leaders to think about building telescopes on the moon. Because as was the story with our previous... Um, exploits in space. The main example I can quote is the International Space Station. It cost a huge amount of money. We didn't, but because we built that, we also, NASA also built the Space Shuttle and hence came the Hubble Space Telescope. So five or ten percent of a mega venture like this could easily c cover the costs of any of these futuristic telescopes. Now, let me conclude by telling you um, that the US presence currently on the moon is this. Okay, <laughs> but the U.S. is having second thoughts. And um, I'll finish by showing you um, from the newspapers yesterday. Um, <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, boots on the moon seems to be the, the next uh, project. And you have uh, uh, Trump with a, a small <laughs> astronaut there. Okay, so, uh, so you know, 
So we're talking about you know, 2040, 2035, 2040 for doing this, um, establishing a base. It'll be mostly robotics, but there'll have to be a human robotic interface, partly because of a time delay. You have to have, you can't just control these things from afar because the, the robots will have all sorts of instantaneous problems maybe. So you need humans present too to direct them properly. So, you know, pe agencies are busy exploring all of this now. To, and I'm hoping that telescopes will be part of their thinking. It's not obvious, but it ought to be. We want more than just a golf course on the moon. Okay, so thank you. That's all. Uh, let, I would like to thank um, especially Elizabeth, Gary, Johanna, Mad Madeline for all of their help this week. It's been amazing. So... And, um, and thank you, all, all of you, for coming to Barry's. It's been wonderful. Um, a great occasion to think about the dark side of things and other sides too. So thank you. Well, that was a fantastic way to, to end the meeting. Um, Thank you very much, Joe, and, and thank you for everything you've given to astronomy and cosmology.